Well, good afternoon. We're going to talk about the molecular targets of novel agents, including adjunctive treatments, currently being investigated. This is an optimistic and good news kind of a talk because there's lots of cool stuff in the pipeline. How many patients with TRD, treatment-resistant depression, do you see each week? So it's a big deal. I've done a few of these lectures and seen others. This seems to be a lot more numbers for this kind of a patient than some of the other topics and diagnoses we've seen. So this may be the heart of uh, what you're interested in. I, I know what bothers me the most are people with treatment resistance, and maybe that's one of the good reasons for coming to this Congress, to get some dialogue going, and maybe see what's coming down the pike here with this lecture. So half of patients respond, and a third of patients remit to monoamine antidepressants. You've known that ever since the STAR-D study. There's no news there. Nobody comes here to learn that, or is worried about patients that have this response. What we're worried about is the other half, that either don't respond, even with 50%, and also the two-thirds that really don't fully remit. And we think that they may have adequate monoamines, so that giving a monoaminergic antidepressant doesn't work. But what they may share with the people who have inadequate monoamines is downstream dysfunction and glutamate neurotransmission or neuroplasticity. So the question is, how can you trigger that without going through the monoamines? And here's the answer. A non-monoaminergic approach. <laughs> so what are those? Instead of leaking out the bottom with our monoamine approaches, we have to use something else to actually put a little patch on there. And we're going to talk about those. Pharmacological modulation either more directly or another route in to glutamate neurotransmission or neuroplasticity. So why is it beyond monoamines and why is it neuroplasticity? You've seen this. It's part of the textbook, but other people have done it as well. If you look at this, which is given antidepressant of the classical type that we have, your monoamines go up. And although some people get well somewhat quickly, the reality is there's a delay, really, in terms of when people go down with their uh, symptoms. So how can the left one be related to the right one if the left one happens right away and the right one occurs with a delay? And the answer is maybe the monoamines trigger this one, which is something in neuroplasticity and glutamate neurotransmission. And so if the monoamines are not capable of doing that, maybe that's why we have treatment resistant at least treatment resistant to monomenergic treatment, depression. So the depressed brain has been talked about inadequate norepinephrine serotonin since donkey's years, but it also shows inadequate neuroplasticity and too much glutamate. Now remember that, I don't know if this year I've talked about it or others have talked about it, that theory for schizophrenia is glutamate hypofunction. This is too much glutamate in depression. And if you act on monoamine systems, the currently available antidepressants may lead to downstream improvements in neuroplasticity and glutamate, but obviously this is one of the reasons I hope you're here is to figure out, I got a lot of people, in fact, my practice is biased towards the people who don't respond because they're only referring to me and probably to you as well when they don't respond. So how about directly targeting glutamate neurotransmission? And in a minute we'll say maybe doing it indirectly, but not through monoamines. But the direct may lead to a faster response. So some of the quick things we're going to go through are ketamine, the ketamine-like drug, at least somewhat like drug, rapacinol, and the two SAGE drugs, which are neurosteroids. That's where the sex and the sizzle is. So let's talk about this. Neuroplasticity can derive from monoamine signal, but then there's a final common pathway. If it works correctly, the monoamine goes into a seven transmembrane, G-protein-linked, second messenger system, 
which makes, in this case, we'll say cyclic A and P, and then it makes a third messenger by phosphorylating and activating phosphokinase, which is a phosphorylating or a calmodulin kinase. These things get woken up as enzymes and they put phosphates on things. Why do you care? Because they activate things floating around in the cytoplasm and turn them into crabs or Krebs, or actually, it's a transcription factor. What's a transcription factor? It's something that transcribes. Remember your DNA to RNA to protein? Transcription is to make DNA start to read out. Kreb is really cyclic AMP response element binding protein, and it's sleeping until your second messenger system, kicked on by monoamines, wakes it up, it goes in, and causes transcription. Now, it has a bunch of complicated things, but one of the things it transcribes is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And that leads to new synapses, changes in cell survival, and new cells being made. And this might be necessary to overcome depression. And so if the top thing was a monoamine, in this case, as you know, there's a rule that Nancy Muntner, my artist, made, which is that that icon shape and yellow always means serotonin, because God told her that that's what serotonin looked like. <laughs> so if serotonin does that uh, from, a, say, an SSRI, then successful neuroplasticity is triggered. So here are the three ways, and you know, we're playing on the same keyboard of dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, and then we have these signaling cascades, all sorts of neat stuff. If you want to look up what they stand for, that's fine, but it doesn't really matter. They're second and third messenger systems. They make transcription factors. This isn't the only one. Turn on protein synthesis, and here's the answer to your pretest question. They turn on the protein to make you more copies of AMPAs. They turn off the protein to make fewer copies of NMDA. They increase these trophic factors, and they net-net reduce glutamate. So the answer is AMPA up and glutamate and NMDA down by antidepressants. So it wouldn't take a rocket scientist to think that maybe depression is the mirror image of this. So increased neuroplasticity and reduced glutamate is what we're after. And maybe we need to do it by a novel way, even though it's the same final common pathway, maybe there's something defective in a patient that it doesn't get triggered by standard antidepressants. So this is why the field has gone to the three Gs, glutamate, GABA, and glycine. So if you have impaired neuroplasticity due to imbalance of these two glutamate, remember, is the universal excitatory neurotransmitter, and GABA is the universal inhibitory neurotransmitter, we think that abnormalities, particularly in the NMDA receptor, may be important for depression. And this is a copy of the NMDA receptor. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see there's various subunits that surround a hole. That hole is an ion channel. For NMDA, the ion channel is for calcium. And down in the ion channel are binding sites for drugs. And when there's dysfunction of glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter involved in many functions, you don't trigger synaptic plasticity, learning, or memory. Studies have shown regional changes in glutamate receptors as well as elevated levels of glutamate in brains of living patients with depression before they're treated. So it's thought that you need to normalize glutamate activity to get normal plasticity. And it's not always possible, as you know, every day from your practice to do that with the monoamine treatments that we have. And it's even made worse under conditions of stress, which enhances glutamate signaling even more and even can rot your brain. Have you ever seen a brain scan of a chronically depressed patient from MRI? The amygdala and hippocampus and even frontal cortex are shrunken because neuroplasticity has stopped over a long period of time. Have you ever stopped to wonder why some people who've been chronically depressed have maybe a rapid improvement when they respond, 
say after a couple of months, they have a relatively rapid improvement for another couple of months. And then there's a very slow but continuing improvement, maybe for a couple of years. And sometimes people aren't really recovered from bad depression for years. But they, they even can reverse it. Well, we think that maybe what's happening is that it's my charisma during those last two years. No. <laughs> is it your charisma that makes people get better after the monoids? Well, maybe it actually is a little bit true. But what's happening, whatever is triggering it, is neuroplasticity. It could take a long time to build those shrunken nerves back, grow you new ones. If you remember, I think I told this audience that I read a paper on the way to the meeting here that suggested that in the normal human brain, you might make 700 new nerves a day in your hippocampus. And we don't know what makes that go up or down, but we know in animal models, at least, it goes down under stress or depression. So to recover from that, once you start making them, doesn't mean, what, what if you lost you know, 30,000 neurons? It's going to take you a while to build those back. So that's what maybe explains that second, longer delayed recovery. Ketamine is a famous thing. We've got a few slides on that because it's the, you know, the, the name of the game and the new kid in town. It directly targets glutamate neurotransmission and or neuroplasticity to lead to fast. What's interesting is not only does ketamine seem to work, and we'll, t we'll define what that means, but it works quickly. And that's...